Right before King David died, he told his son Solomon to be strong, follow God's ways, and no matter what, not to worship other gods. Shortly after Solomon took over as king, God appeared to him and said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Worried about following in his father's footsteps, Solomon asked God to give him wisdom, to know the difference between right and wrong. God not only promised to give Solomon wisdom, but great riches and honor as well. The first test of Solomon's wisdom happened when two prostitutes came to him. There was a young child that each of them claimed was theirs. Solomon knew one of them had to be wrong. So he asked his servants to bring out a sword and suggested to the woman that he cut the boy in two and give each of them half. One of the women was so worried that the boy would be killed that she immediately asked Solomon to give the child to the other woman. Solomon saw her love and protection and knew that it had to be her baby, so he gave the boy to her. The Israelites were in awe of Solomon's great wisdom. He ruled for many years, growing in wealth and fame. He also wrote down many wise sayings called Proverbs. During his reign, Solomon planned to finish building the temple his father, David, wanted to build. They built a temple that was not incredibly large, but was unbelievably beautiful and detailed. It was 90 feet by 30 feet and had two bronze pillars that led into the place where sacrifices were made. When it was finished, Solomon and the other leaders sacrificed a huge number of animals in worship to God. When they did, the whole temple filled with a thick cloud of smoke. Solomon prayed, asking God to meet the Israelites in the temple and hear their prayers. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from the sky and burned up the animal sacrifices. That night, God appeared to Solomon again and promised to bless him in all that he did, as long as he would keep following God. In some areas, Solomon did follow what God told him to, but in others, like worshiping other gods, he failed. Because of this, the kingdom of Israel would be taken from his sons, and they would not enjoy the peaceful, successful reign that he had. We're going to get our recap of not last week, but two weeks ago since we had a snow day, uh, or a freezing rain day, I should say, as we uh, catch up on the story. morning. It is actually really good to see you here this morning. We know that the, the roads were, you know, covered with snow and not every area has been plowed out, but it's great to see those who are here this morning. And we're reminded that where there are two or more gathered, uh, that God is there, that God's spirit is here this morning. And we want to not only praise him and lift him up, but look to meet with him and have him speak uh, to us as we dive into his word. This morning, I'm, uh, we're on chapter 14. Two weeks ago, we did chapter 13, looking at the character of Solomon. But today, uh, we're beginning a very different topic. But I, I've been thinking about a family, or two families, uh, that uh, relate to today's topic. So I'm going to get you uh, to raise your hand if you know anything about the Hatfields and McCoys. I have a theory on this. All right. I'm looking at the younger people just to see if they have any idea. No. Okay, good. Then I'll update you a little bit. Uh, the Hatfields and McCoys are two famous families from the United States. But as you can tell, uh, those of us who are a little bit older, we still know who they were even in Canada. These families had a feud, a family feud, not the game show, from 1863 to 1901. And it went, so that feud which went for a period of 38 years. Not just two people feuded, but their entire families and descendants were against each other. The first recorded incident 
came in 1863 when Asa McCoy, what's his name? Asa McCoy was returning from fighting in the Civil War and was murdered. And one of the Hatfields was, Hatfields was blamed for it, although it was later discovered that the gentleman was, who was uh, uh, blamed couldn't have done it because he was homesick at the time, and it wouldn't have been possible for him to do it. The second recorded incident of violence between the families, not just of anger, but actual violence, took place 13 years later over a dispute over a hog. These families have become famous for their division. Even today, their descendants uh, still pretend to be angry at each other because I think it's a great marketing campaign. But you can see their feud appearing on television. if you remember, as a good king, he began with the right question, asking for wisdom, but he eventually went off course and even the inf and began having a, a thousand women, seven hundred of them wives, uh, and the uh, and and the other is concub three hundred as concubines, and their influence, which God had told the the uh, Israelites not to intermarry with uh, people from pagan cultures because. Who you live with begins to influence you. And eventually, over time, Solomon began worshipping other gods as well. God judged Solomon for worshipping other gods and said his son would no longer be the king over Israel. But someone from under him in his leadership would rise up and take that leadership from him. Who here has the story? I'm going to get you to... I, this is not, we're not going to be reading scripture. There's transitions and scripture within the story. We're going to read the transition to where we are today in italics at the start of 14, page 193, if you've got the story. And if you don't have it, don't worry, I'm going to read it out loud. Through the prophet Ahijah, God told a rising young star in Solomon's administration by the name of Jeroboam that he would be the future king. God would give Jeroboam all but one of the tribes of Israel. After possibly making a preemptive bid for the throne, Jeroboam learned to wait on God's timing. Solomon was not ready to relinquish the throne and tried to kill Jeroboam to keep him from becoming king. Jeroboam fled. He fled to Egypt and waited there for an opportunity to make his next move. After Solomon died, his own tribe of Judah automatically accepted his son Rehoboam as the next king. But much of the population, especially from the other tribes, had grown to resent Solomon's heavy taxation and conscripted labor for his grand projects. As representatives from all of Israel gathered to make Rehoboam king, they let their complaints be known. Jeroboam hears that uh, Rehoboam has been made king. He had, uh, uh, he had, so he heads back from, uh, from Egypt to Israel for this inauguration. You see, at this point, he had had to flee because he had gotten ahead of God. Unlike David, who when God said, I'm going to make you the new king, David waited patiently and God worked in David during that time. Uh, Jeroboam says, well, God's anointed me. I'm going to go on my own timeline and work it, work it out. And instead, uh, Rehoboam decides to try to kill him, and he has to flee. So he's coming back to see if Rehoboam might be less harsh than his father, uh, King Solomon. And I shouldn't say Rehoboam tried to kill him. Solomon uh, tried to kill him. Rehoboam, in answering the challenge of Jeroboam, first goes to the elders who served his dad. The older, the experienced guys, he gets their opinion and they give him some actual wise advice. It's great to see people who actually give advice that would be godly. Page 194, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 7, we find this passage. They said to him, If you will be a servant to these people 
and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servant. So Jeroboam had come and was hoping to see that maybe Rehoboam wasn't that bad and that maybe he would relent and the other uh, people from the other tribes that had come along with him where they were waiting to see if maybe Rehoboam wouldn't be as harsh as Solomon had been or as, as taxation and his conscripted labor wouldn't be so hard on them. And the advice that Rehoboam is given by his wise advisors is to to uh, loosen up a little bit, to uh, ease up a little bit on the taxation and the requirements of the people, because if he was to do that, people would side with him. They would be with him, not for just now, but for generations to come. And it was wonderful advice. It was godly advice. But Rehoboam rejects that advice and goes to some young men who he grew up with. The young men, uh, page 194 in, in the story, 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 10 to 12 says, The young men who had grown up with him replied, These people have said to you, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. The sad part of where this story turns is that, uh, is that Rehoboam takes the second advice. Instead of taking the advice from the wise elders who, who gave godly advice, he ends up taking the advice of his friends. The inexperienced and definitely... Uh, heavily invested with sticking with, uh, with Rehoboam's desires for advice. If you remember, we've been going through a timeline with four phases, and I want to bring that up for a sec. There it is. This is the timeline that we're looking at the story, and from the start to the end, it's a story of God working, and it begins with us getting separated from God, and we're now in phase two. And at the, through this, we've seen God working out his people to be the way in which he's going to bring salvation to the world. He's set models in his people and how they are to be led of how he, that show who he is and what kind of a king he is as God, our, our king in heaven. But as we zoom in a little bit, we see that around 930 B.C., that there's a huge shift in God's people that the kingdom ends up divided. The kingdom ends up breaking apart. There's a division that happens that shouldn't happen amongst God's people, but it does. At this point, the nation of Israel divides, and it's over something much greater than the ownership of a hog. Of the 12 tribes of Israel, only those living in the towns of Judah stay with Rehoboam. The rest rally behind Jeroboam and make him their king. Ten of the twelve tribes from the na nation of Israel to the north, and the tribes of Simeon is melded into the tribe of Judah, and they form the nation of Judah to the south. The division happened in 930 BC, as you see on the chart, but it remains that way throughout the rest of the Old Testament, about 530 years in the Old Testament, and then in the in-between period as well. If you've ever had division, you know that division is a nasty place to live. It not only creates tension, frustration, and anger, it can rob us of our joy. If you've been in a, a part of a tent, or that kind of division in family, you know that it can ruin weddings. It can break families. It can handicap our effectiveness. And most of all, as the church, when there is division within the church, it can undermine the church's witness. And that's what was happening in God's people. Instead of following God, they were allowing uh, their own sin to handicap. Jesus talked about division. He said in Luke chapter 11, verse 17, when talking about, when he was being accused of uh, raising uh, or doing miracles by the power of demonic forces, he says that a house divided itself cannot stand. And that was his, his simple argument. He goes, if we're not together, 
if I'm doing the opposite thing of, you know, of the rest of my house, and he was talking about if God and his son, and if, if he was doing something different, if that's how God worked, he, it wouldn't stand. It would be, he would become ineffective. And that's true also within our families, in the church, in our relationships. So what can we do about avoiding division in our house? This morning, we're going to look at the division that occurred amongst God's people. And like our last uh, session, uh, chapter 13 with Solomon, we're going to look and learn from their mistakes. Sometimes things aren't in Scripture to say, this is what you should do. They're there to say, learn from where they failed. So the first point, if you're following along in your bulletin and you're a, an active, uh, if you're someone who writes to learn or you are an active learner, uh, the first one is be careful who you listen to. First of all, be careful who you listen to. And I put A, B, and C there. It's just some points under there. First of all, have wise counselor. Have wide, have wise counselors. The first mistake is easy to spot in Rehoboam's decision making. We are told that he ignores the advice of the older, wiser advisors, and instead puts all his his eggs in the basket of the younger friends. Rather than listening to the wiser, more experienced advisors, he listens to the guys who haven't actually heard the people, understood, been, haven't been around enough to figure things out. Often, Scripture points out in, in the wisdom literature, we see this pattern uh, through all the Scripture, that often age and experience are a part of growing in wisdom. I say often because it's not always true. As I've been going through scripture with uh, Tuesdays and Thursday mornings with, uh, with a family member, we've been going talking with the Pharisees and th- how uh, the question was, how could they miss this? And I go, yeah, uh, not everyone who uh, who's, knows God's word and is older sees things as they are. You can be, be in darkness even if you uh, have years and years of experience. Although uh, age and experience is often good indicators of the first place you should look for wisdom. It isn't always. But you should always make sure that you look for wise counselors. People who don't, haven't experienced, have no, have no depth because they haven't uh, looked carefully, you should leave those, that advice behind. And we can see that right away. It's immediately apparent uh, in Rehoboam's decision-making. But there's a second part when we look at his friends, B, have honest counselors. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6, and this is written by who? Who wrote the book of Proverbs? Solomon. I mean, most, yeah. So most of the wisdom in Proverbs is from Solomon. Uh, it says, he says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Most of us have friends that are, are the kind of people that when things are bad, stick with us. They're, they're not fair-weather friends. They're people who come alongside of us when things get difficult, when, when everyone's against us. They're the kind of people that come and support us and encourage us. But that's our, our general friends. There should be something else that you have in your friend groups. Your best friends. Your best friends should be more than that. They shouldn't just be people who support you when things get hard. They should be the kind of honest counselors that when things get hard because you are the one who's wrong, that will tell you, will say, hey, listen, I really uh, think that you should, shouldn't have done that. Is everything all right? Or I see some changes in your behavior. The, as a pastor, as a Christian, I want people in my life the, I mean, I want them to be close uh, people who will say to me, listen, is everything all right with you and God? I'm, I'm just concerned that things seem a little, you know, flat in your walk with God. We need to have people who will st- say to us, no, I think you're wrong when we're wrong. And we know we can trust them because we've experienced that they love us through uh, up and down. They're much more rare than just the friends who stick with us through hard times. 
There's very few people probably in your life who can speak that way to you, and you might be married to the only person who can speak to you that way. But hopefully that's the person, or you have friends around you. If you're a guy, sometimes it might be the friends around you who you have that will say, listen, I'm worried about how things are with your marriage. Or I'm really worried about, you know, I see you kind of falling off, and I feel like this is becoming the center of your life. Is everything all right? C, listen to the other side. And I just want to say that uh, when we come up against things, there are times that, you know, we know that uh, there might be a time that you know that you're doing the right thing. You're sure things are good. And you know you things are good with God. You've d- you're choosing the right thing. But we should always listen to the other side. Because there are things we might not understand that we can learn from listening to the other side. One of the, one of the areas I find that really interesting is, is when you have like generational things and you have um, people who are grandparents and people who are teenagers. I used to think that they were sometimes were worlds apart, but when they actually sit down and listen to each other, it's amazing the commonality there are between generations. Sometimes you can see all the bad when you, when you don't spend the time to listen, but not see the history behind something. Why that's so valuable. Sometimes you can't see the good that comes out of uh, like our younger generations. There's an, open spiritu- an openness to spirituality that is such an incredible blessing and a care for the whole people around the world. It's important that we listen to all, to all that's being said, not just to win, a, win an argument. Number two, division is seldom one-sided. Own your part. Division is seldom one-sided. Own your part. At first, it appears that Rehoboam is the one who's completely in the wrong. But when you get the whole story, you see that Jeroboam also played a part. First, before Jeroboam is, is even in the uh, before Rehoboam is even in the story, Jeroboam is told by the prophet that he'll be king. And what did he what did he do? He takes matters into his own hands. He makes his move to take the kingdom from Solomon, Rehoboam's dad, and that attempt failed because it was outside the timing of God. God said that it wouldn't come during Solomon's reign; that it would come uh, when his son ruled, and that caused Solomon to hunt him down, and it caused him to have to flee to Egypt. Jeroboam was ambitious. He wanted the position God had said it would be given to him, but he wasn't willing to wait. Not only that, after he gets what he wants, and he does take control of the ten tribes, uh, he, uh, he keeps the people, the ten tribes, from going back to Jerusalem to worship God and offer sacrifices. Because he's worried that if they go back, that they might realign with Rehoboam. Because that's, because Jerusalem is there. So people might, if they have to go back to worship, that they might go back and uh, that could jeopardize his kingship. Instead, he makes two golden sacrifice, uh, two golden calves and set them up for people to worship and to sacrifice to. Now, we've been going through the story, and we've seen this sort of before. Half as bad, I guess. If you recall from the story of Moses, how did that work out for God's people when they set up the, uh, the golden calf? Was God happy with that? No. I mean, God, God judged them for that. God was very unhappy with uh, their response. Uh, and here's, uh, here's uh, Rehoboam, uh, Jeroboam going, you know, I think after all I've seen in the past, all the lessons we've learned as a people, you know what I really need to do? I need to make some golden calves. It's like, no, you already know that God will judge you for that. God sends a prophet to Jeroboam to confront him. And here is the result on page 197. Even after this, Jeroboam did not change his evil ways, we're told. We will see a few pages later uh, that this led to his ultimate downfall. After being a minister for 20 years, I can tell you, I have only seen a handful of occasions where division is completely one-sided. They are seldom exactly 50-50. I would say most times it's not 50-50. Sometimes it's 80-20. But usually there's something that both parties are contributing 
to the division. Not always, but the vast majority of times. And that is not just within the church. In relationships, in marriages, when there's division, there's usually, there's usually a part that we play. It's important. And I teach, I've even taught my kids since they were young. It's one of the greatest things you can do in maturity is have humility. Even when you're the one who's 80% right, be willing to be the one that is first to go. I am sorry for the things I did wrong. I'm sorry for how I hurt you. To be, that is real spiritual maturity. It is grace. It's the kind of love God has for us and we should have for others. In division and conflict, you can't control the other person, but you can own your part. This is the posture of humility that is the, creates the best environment for healing. Number three, number three, division has a generational effect. And you've probably seen this at times. You probably can think of people in our community. Maybe you know someone as a friend who that you've seen this happen to. People who don't learn to work through conflict have children who don't know how to as well. I want you to listen to these passages. Page 199, 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 30. There was continual warfare between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. 1 Kings 15, 6, page 199. There was war between Abijah and Jeroboam through Abijah's lifetime. Page 200, 1 Kings chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 16. There was war between Asa and Basha, and Basha, king of Israel, throughout their reigns. There was a 960-year span from the kingdom divides to Jesus' birth. Remember that during Jesus' ministry, how Jesus dealt with division. He encountered the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus was going from Jerusalem to Galilee, and to get there... He had to go through Samaria, which is where Jesus encountered the woman at the well. The Samaritans are the remnants of the Jews, still living there from the northern kingdom established under Jeroboam. The Jews from the south. Now, did you know that? You might not know where the Samaritans came from. The Jews from the south, from Rehoboam's kingdom, or Judah, despised the Samaritans so much They would go out of their way to walk around Samaria to avoid contact with them. But Jesus is a reconciler. He goes right through Samaria. He talks with the woman at the well for the purpose of reconciliation. And not just reconciliation, stepping out of the boundaries of, you know, the northern and southern kingdoms, but also because he's reconciling them with God. Division can ruin families for generations. Like the Hatfields and McCoys, when you decide to destroy a relationship, it can usually run through generations, cause splits. When your family, you split with a family member because you can't find it in you to humble yourself, to try to work out reconciliation, it can affect your your kids' relationships further on. It can split churches. As followers of Jesus, this is never how it should be. And I'm not saying that's how it is here. I'm just saying that we see this pattern uh, within Scripture. But it's a great thing to learn from in our relationships, whether it be in people within church, in our marriages, in our friendships, even with those who might consider, consider themselves our enemies. And Romans 12, 18 actually uh, deals with that as well. It says, if at all possible, as far as it depends on you, speaking to us as the church, live at peace with everyone. It says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you. It doesn't mean you'll be able to fix every relationship, but it does mean that everything you should do should be towards reconciliation. Because we're followers of Jesus Christ, and that is who he is. That leads us to our last point. Rehoboam and Jeroboam aren't the ones uh, who struck the first match. It actually was Rehoboam's dad. It was King Solomon. In our previous chapter, King Solomon was doing great. It was a time of peace for the children of Israel. In response to Solomon's request, he is filled with God's wisdom and is reaping the, the benefits galore. But little by little, he stops applying it to his life and his kingdom. 
We talked about a frog being dropped in boiling water. It'll jump right out. But if you put a, a, a frog in cool water and gradually change, change the temperature, that he won't ju jump out and can be, uh, can be cooked alive. By the time that they become aware of what is happening, uh, God's people were in a bad place. And it began with Solomon. It began with 700 wives and 300 concubines. And these foreign wives worshiping other gods. What does the first commandment say? Solomon knew that it said, you shall have no other gods before me. And God visits Solomon one day and gives him this message. Page 192 in the story, 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 9 to 13. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude, and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. That's 1 Kings 11, 9 to 13. Here is the most important principle of this lesson. If you are threatened with a feud, number four, getting your focus off of God is usually the root cause. Getting your focus off of God is usually the root cause of division in your family, your church, or a nation. But a family, a church, or a nation who stays close to God puts the biggest wall of protection around them to preserve unity. The single thing I can do to preserve unity of, of this church as your senior pastor, as your lead pastor, is to walk closely and humbly before God. The single greatest thing I can do as a husband is to walk closely and humbly with God. The, great, the single greatest thing I can do as a dad is to walk humbly before God and closely with him. And the same is true for you. The greatest thing we can do when we find ourselves at odds with others is to ask, have I taken my focus off God? There's something, you know... We, when I, when I was preaching last year, I remember getting into the, the idea of, of what we can and can't do. Some things just don't make sense if we're believers. And one of the things that I don't believe we ever have the ability to say is, I can't forgive. Because we're followers of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, if you don't forgive others, you can't expect my forgiveness. So Jesus says, this is how it is. He says, you want to follow me? Be like me. What, what, what was Jesus about? He was about forgiveness. Even as I was reading through the uh, Passover, I could see Jesus washing the feet of uh, uh, Judas Iscariot and thinking, there's incredible grace in how Jesus treated everybody. As we look at uh, this kingdom divided, there's some incredible lessons to learn. Jesus said, a house divided cannot stand uh, say a house divided against itself cannot stand. But there's something incredible to learn. And it's the, this is the thing that I think we should uh, take away. It's the thing that should transform how we live. How we should approach things as a church and how we should approach things with our spouses, with our children, with our friends, with our enemies, and even other believers as part of the body. A house united can withstand almost anything. And that's God's prayer for you. Jesus prayed that we would be united. Although there is a line of kings who were off track. Do you remember the guy, uh, the first name of the guy who was the McCoy who uh, was killed? Asa. Oh, <laughs> excellent. Fantastic. You did remember. Wow, almost everyone remembered. Asa. So Asa was the guy who that, that division began with. But the story of the kingdom divided in our scripture is not all negative. We see a positive move when, the, when a king comes in in the midst of that. Although generations can go off 
off uh, and off and off, further off. Once in a while, you have someone who turns their heart towards God and God begins to bless. Although there were a line of kings who were off track after Solomon, King Asa gives us hope. Same name. Through Asa, the McCoys experienced division. Through King Asa, God began to work his life and his power again. It says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Just because there had been a pattern set in history doesn't mean that God can't redeem what's going on in your life. Just because there has been a pattern of division in your own life, even when, even when my heart is hard, God, if I turn to God, he can do incredible reconciliation in my life and work incredible miracles when I humble myself. Maybe that is unity within your marriage that you're looking for. Perhaps it's healing division. Maybe you have problems with a classmate at school. Maybe God is talking about division that you have with someone that's been in the church or might not even be in the church anymore because of that division. We should be a people who continually seek reconciliation. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that you show us not only the people who followed you wholeheartedly, but uh, the people who failed you miserably, the people who started on the right track and uh, went off track, and we can see in their lives where to, where to correct or where not to make those same mistakes. God, we pray, we pray that we would be the people uh, who would lay our, our pride down. Jesus, we're told, came and became our servant. It is nothing for us to serve others, knowing that the God of creation served us. Father, if we have um, problems with our brothers or sisters, we pray that we would leave our sacrifice at the altar to go and reconcile and then come back to worship you. God, we pray that... Uh, that you would work in our lives. And we know that it doesn't always change our relationship with others when we go to reconcile. But we do know that it changes our posture towards them and it changes our relationship with you. That you can do incredible things in our lives when we have humility and when we love others like you do. God, we pray that uh, the marks of our people here that it would be of unity within the church that our marks of our relationships in our homes would be of love and uh, of care and laying down our own, uh, our own pride so that we can lift others up. God, we pray that even when we encounter people uh, who we find the most difficult, that God, we would be quick uh, to see God's love for us in, our, in how we should love them. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.